You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. Your next stop, the Mind Screw. His name is Joshua Burner. Age 28. Occupation, internet reviewer. The video, top 10 mindfuck Yay. bosses. You're the guy. Ah, the mindfuck. Yay. That moment of the game where everything just kind of goes out of whack and the only reaction you could possibly give is... I'm only three and a half years old. Now, there are a few pieces of criteria for these entries. For one, they have to involve trippy imagery. For two, they have to involve some breaking of the fourth wall and or meta commentary. For three, they have to be weird even by the context of the game. All of the entries here fulfill at least one of these criteria. The more and better they fulfill, the higher they place. Without further ado, hold on to your gray matter, we're diving in. It's been a while since I talked about Dynasty Warriors. Let's fix that. When you think Dynasty Warriors, what do you think of? Campiness, killing thousands with a single guy, epic cinematics to rock music? Well, how about an illusionist taunting you by bringing up phantoms of past enemies and current friends? No? Well, you haven't played Dynasty Warriors 7. Well, I guess a lot of people haven't, but let's not talk about that. During the Wu storyline, Sun Tzu decides to go for a walk to clear his head after lamenting on how he saw one of his compatriots die in front of him by falling off a castle roof after he thought Sun Tzu was going to kill him. While going for a walk, fog starts to appear around him, and a mysterious illusionist named Yuji appears, and things get a bit... weird. Yuji teleports around the area, leading you into different traps consisting of phantoms of Sun Tzu's old enemies, the retainer that died, and even his own father who died a few stages before. The phantoms taunt Sun Tzu by criticizing his mission and past actions, making him seem like the villains he is after. By the end of the stage, Yuji himself appears by multiplying into several phantoms himself and attacks you, all the while it's foggy and weirdly rock music is playing. Yeah, way to bring down the mood. While Futures Warrior games like Hyrule Warriors and Fire Emblem Warriors play on this trope, it was a departure from normal Dynasty Warriors tone and mood. It starts and ends with a very mysterious and dark tone, very unlike the series. While there are still guitarists in the middle section, which is definitely Warriors, but for a bit, it was out there. It's also weird that this guy is never explained. He shows up in an optional stage later in the game, but has no connection to the core Wu story any longer. Unfortunately, this battle does end tragically as Yuji's goal was to distract Sun Tzu long enough to have archers kill him. It is lower due to not being that trippy compared to other entries, but for just being so out there in terms of Dynasty Warriors standards, I think it still deserves a spot. Welcome to Psychedelia, man, where the road to enlightenment is an inner peace is Pay with groovy rainbow bubbles and whacked out zombies that multiply like bunnies, man! Like zoinks, man! You end one more sentence with man, I get to remove one bone of my choosing from your body. Yeah, I can't keep that up either. After getting tricked, Juliet Starling finds herself in, supposedly, the mind of one of the dark purveyors, Mariska. And yes, she's basically an undead hippie stereotype, from her clothes to her spaced out preachy dialogue to her having a freaking sitar. And, of course, plenty of psychedelic imagery. Fighting Mariska really isn't that hard. Just avoid her attack, shoot her until her health bar goes down, slice her up in three phases. But the environment is so dang distracting. The trippy color scheme and imagery are blinding. She'll start attacking you with tractors and chicken heads in phase two. And after you chop her up at the end of each phase, she multiplies like a paramecium. And even purposely splits herself and have to bring out more zombie hippie duplicates. Uh, who developed this game again? Okay. Honestly, the only reason Mariska's lower is mainly because the other entries are a lot more freaky. And like I said, fighting her isn't too difficult once you got it figured out. Still, now we gotta know what happens when you fight a zombie fresh out of Woodstock. You get a colorful smackdown with a literal mindful experience. Ever heard of a game called No Straight Roads? It's a music-based hack and slash where you play as a rock band duo trying to take on an EDM music label that has a monopoly over the industry and the city. The game itself has some normal trippy imagery, but that comes to a head when you fight Eve. 
Eve, being an artist and sculptor, has a very Escher design to her fight. It begins as she launches hands and projectiles at you while she teleports by diving into a bunch of paintings. As you damage her, she will change the scenery and even the perception of the arena. After a little bit, she will separate your two playable characters, and as you switch between them, you would need to survive attacks that get trippier and trippier as the battle continues. She adds lasers, more giant hands, a complete change in design and depth, and you feel like you're fighting the Illuminati with that stupid pyramid in the background. More on that later. The fight will eventually end as you break enough mirrors in the back to make Eve fall back into a void. Here, the battle is less trippy, where you just need to chase her, but the entire white void is a little alarming. And the camera puzzle that you get right before the conclusion where you control both characters at the same time is super trippy, but still challenging and fun. Since the boss fight is more trippy than mind screwy, it is lower, but considering all the trippy imagery and sounds they encompass the fight, it isn't surprising to see it here at all. Now, it is a recent game, so definitely not a game you should glance over if you're interested. Definitely not a game I can glance over since a certain scorpion won't SHUT UP ABOUT IT! Let's be charitable and say DMC isn't exactly a world-renowned game, but it's home to quite the jarring boss fight. And for this list, that's exactly what we're looking for. Bob Barbus isn't terribly subtle about what he is, at least in a meta context. Oh, running a news organization named after a predator. I'm sure no one could guess what they're referencing. Still, other than that and Bob clearly being a spoof of a news anchor on the network they're spoofing, I like to think that the idea was that all news organizations are at some level corrupt. Or maybe I'm giving DMC too much credit. American news is a big pile of crap! Anyway, the boss fight starts properly when Dante grappling hooks his way into an illusion of the Raptor News Network logo. When the screen clears, Dante is standing on what is honestly a pretty boring black circular arena. Fortunately, the representation of Bob Barbus quickly appears to steal the show. He's basically a modern reinterpretation of the MCP from Tron. Little bits of his human face floating around, trying to cover up his demonic visage, I love it! Now, this alone doesn't quite get him on the list. Sure, his face is pretty trippy and the random images are interesting, but the first face of the fight after some banter between Dante and Bob is pretty vanilla. Hit the glowing red weak points to open up Bob's face for an attack and repeat until the first health bar is gone. Then we get into the real meat and potatoes of the fight. A grappling hook prompt appears over Bob's eye and Dante swings into his face. He's then transported into an arena where he fights off hordes of demons while Bob commentates over it, pretending like Dante is slaughtering innocent civilians. At age eight, he attacked and killed the head nurse at St. Lamia Orphanage. I saw one girl, like, beg for her life, but, like, he said he was gonna kill her anyway. And then he did. The camera work for these segments is really what sells it. Instead of the over-the-shoulder view you've been working with for most of the game, you have to control Dante while dealing with a static camera that's supposed to be filming Dante from a helicopter. The whole thing gives a very They Live vibe, particularly the scene where the main character puts on the glasses and sees the world for what it truly is. That's why this fight gets on the list. If I had to make one suggestion, make the arena a little more lively. You know, shouts from the home audience booing Dante or cheering as the SWAT raid happened would have really brought the whole thing together. Final fun fact, Barbus is actually one of the 72 demons of the Ars Goetia and described as the great president of hell who speaks truthfully of secrets and hidden things. He's also supposed to be a lion, another predatory animal. Symbolism win? The Bravely series has an interesting relationship with the fourth wall. Throughout the two games, we are slowly given more and more hints that the so-called celestial realm is actually our own world. After a slew of events where the fourth wall is, well, mutilated, you finally meet the game's true villain, Providence. Yeah, that is just the unholy offspring of Azrael, god of hyperdeath, and Falco. Anyway, Providence wants to take over the celestial realm, i.e. the real world. For such an insane setup, however, the battle is pretty straightforward. The only thing you have to worry about is this BS instant death attack, unless you choose pass it with auto life, of course. Then as you try to leave, Not so fast! I've got some children I need to make into corpses! Yeah! We had an agreement that that wouldn't come back. 
right off the bat, the main gimmick of the fight is that Providence doesn't exactly play by your rules. See, if you take too long with your turns, he'll actually interrupt you. This puts a lot of tension on you as you have a very limited time to actually put in your commands. I have to pretty much play by instinct. Then once you get him to low health, he forces your party members to attack each other and then tries to delete your save data. No, my save game, stop. I'm on the final boss fight in Oblivion. I can't start again from the beginning. Fortunately for the player, all the protagonists and most of the antagonists come to cheer you on so you can deliver the final blow. Wait a minute, why does that sound familiar? I guess any of you are wondering though, this game actually came out before Undertale. Okay, jokes aside, Providence really pulled out all the stops. With a lot of build up to the fourth wall breaks incorporated into the story as well as all the ways it gets implemented into the combat, I'd say Bill Cipher's edgy cousin earned their place on the list. Ooh, a game called Pony Island! Let's see what this is about! Oh, hi, Satan. The world has fallen. There is only entropy. We are but specks in a never encompassing destiny. Okay, for those who have not seen the horror that is Pony Island, it is a metaphysical PC game where you thought it was an old arcade running gunner, but it was actually a point and click adventure game that was created by the devil the whole time. Honestly, the entire game game is kind of a mindfuck. Oh. Your main goal is to traverse the datascape of the game, trying to progress as many demons get in your way and make your life frustrating and by now makes you think, what the heck am I playing? These demons are just programs that Lucifer created to impede you and, in a sense, they're bosses, as you need to think creatively to beat each one. That's where Asmodeus.exe comes in. Unlike the other demons you fought up to this point, Asmodeus.exe tends to have a more sophisticated AI to them. At least, he says he does. Unlike the other demons, he asks you questions and tries to mess with you as you answer them, like hacking your Steam friends list, asking trick questions, and pretending to crash the game. It gets frustrating enough that it feels like the constant fight you've been having with this trolley game is coming to a head. Honestly, it might seem weird when the entire game is trying to mess with you, but it is jarring in itself when you get to a program that messes with you with just questions. You drop your guard and it crashes the game. They just stay on your toes to the end. Hey guys, you wanna hear me talk about Undertale? Well, we're not talking about that. We're talking about Earthbound. Oh. Yet, Earthbound is a pretty weird game in general. After all, you're beating up hippies as kids with psychic powers. Don't take that out of context. Anyways, considering it's Earthbound, you can probably guess the boss. Oh no, guy! Gosh! When you have a boss whose attack you cannot comprehend what it is and what it looks like, well, the fetus joke has been a bit overplayed, but he's an eldritch abomination that extends to the deepest reaches of your mind. Fighting Gygus feels like you're fighting your SNES. Everything is so distorted. It feels like the console itself is possessed by an eldritch horror and you need to fight with everything you got to beat it. Well, the battle itself can be pretty disorienting with all the trippy and staticky imagery, but in the same vein of the most dramatic JRPG final battles, the entire world's prayers come together to save you. In the end, even after landing the final blow, the screen turns off and it makes you wonder, did I win? But you did win, and hopefully, your mind is all the safer. Honestly, the whole battle is an entire trip, and is literally the poster boy of mindfuck yeah. losses for years to come. The only reason it's number four is the next few games actually did it a bit better, but let's be fair, Gygus is still in a league of his own. Just try to block Porky from your mind, he is just as disturbing. Now we're on Undertale. Picture this, you're deep in the underground and it's pitch black. Finally, you see a light and you're greeted by Howdy, I'm Flower. A friendly talking flower. <laughs> Weird, but not so bad. Aw, he wants to share his friendliness pellets. Nope, those are bullets. Flower Boy's out for blood. But Toriel saves you, so happy ending, right? <laughs> Fate. Actually, he pops up later, depending on the run, but I want to focus on the neutral run in this case. 
After your battle with Asgore, Flowey returns with enough human souls to become a god. He spazzes and twitches while making threats, and then... Uh... What even? Yeah, what, what, what they said. Well, that, uh, that certainly is a boss. How do I even describe this one? It looks like what happens when you have too much fun on your art program. Uh, oh, it's literally called Photoshop Flowey. Huh. Oh, and he's not just a pretty face. He puts you through the ringer by throwing stars, lasers, and practically the kitchen sink at you. Oh, and things go beyond meta for this fight, even by Undertale standards. Flowey messes with your save file, and if you think it's over after you die, <laughs> yeah, no. He breaks you out of the game over screen and lays into you all over again. Well, it's nice to know I won't look at flowers the same way again. Hey, sweetie, I wanted to put these on our bedside. Never mind. I still say that Genocide Run Sands is the hardest Undertale boss, but Photoshop Flowey is no slouch either. It's definitely possible to beat him, but you gotta play smart and try not to be too distracted by his foster clock of a design. It's so eerie because his boss fight in the pacifist run is way more deep and tragic. While here, it's literal death by bitmap. Oh boy, this was a tricky one because there are so many freaky boss fights in the Arkham series that completely warp and twist our literal view of reality. Mad Hatter and Rachel Ghoul in City, Copperhead in Origins, even Joker's ghost stalking you at night all involve us overcoming a bizarre, frightening hallucination before returning to a normal plane of existence. Or at least as normal as Batman's life can get. However, in the end, I had to give it up to the bone-chilling spectacles from the original game, the Scarecrow Fights. We all know Scarecrow's ghoulish game, using Toxin to drive his foes mad with fear. And lucky us in Asylum, we get to see its effects on the bat not once, but three times. Every time Batman gets gassed by the Toxin, the world around him is transformed into a horrific nightmare. In one hallucination, he's forced to confront the possibility of failing. And a jump scare. Eh, nothing in this game really scares me all that much. I'm in house! I cast the out, demon! Another incident forces him to relive the tragedy of his parents' death. Finally, in the third encounter, the game seemingly resets itself back to the opening with Joker and Batman's positions reversed. Which is kind of more funny than scary without context. Yeah, a lot of people, including myself, thought the game broke. After each nightmare ends, the bat finds himself in a hellish obstacle course where he needs to keep out of sight from an enormous scarecrow and literally shine the light to cut through this ghoul's darkness. For the first major trip out in the Arkham series, the scarecrow nightmares really set the bar for how freaky the series wasn't afraid to get. We got a first-hand experience of how damaging Scarecrow's influence can be on a monumental level. And we see just how vulnerable the Bat's psyche can be, making a deadly game of hide-and-seek into a battle to reclaim your sanity. Yeah, there are small hints that kind of give away that reality is becoming undone, but honestly, they're so subtle that they don't ruin the sheer terror of the visions. Also, it goes without saying that the Nightmare World levels are better handled here than in Night, where they're just generic Batmobile levels. Seriously, I love the Batmobile, it's cool and all, but too much of a good thing is suffocating! <sighs> Armored Ventus, Dream Drop Distance. Gotta work in that cage mention somehow. <laughs> Grotesque Queen, Dragon Guard. Fight Assault Goddess via Rhythm Game in Tokyo. Enough said. Hugh Bliss, Sam and Max. More of a mini game than a boss fight, but he puts you on a merry-go-round of death that doesn't end until you spoil his magic tricks. Zant, Twilight Princess. He turns into this Gmod puppet. It's unnerving. Rachel Ghoul, Arkham City. This is why you shouldn't drink random concoctions at your buddy's bonfire, Batsy. Pfft, lightweight. Monica, Doki Doki Literature Club. Eh, boss fight might not be the best term to describe this one, but she can mess with the game files, so I guess it counts. Metal Gear Solid. 
So many bosses could have made it here. The Sorrow, Screaming Mantis, most of Metal Gear Solid 2's final part. Well, that one really isn't a boss, but still one of the trippiest things in the series. Too bad this isn't mindful moments. Considering this is Metal Gear, there's already this expectancy that what you're about to play is going to have at least something stupid among the normally super serious story. Well, back in Metal Gear Solid 1, this was pretty new, and when Psycho Mantis showed up, the true mindfuck was real. Mantis didn't just break the fourth wall, he interacted with the player and trolled you. He made your controller rumble. He made you think he changed the channel. He mentioned a bunch of games by reading your memory card, including Castlevania or Suikoden if you're playing the PlayStation version, to Super Mario Sunshine and Melee if you played the GameCube remake. Speaking of the GameCube remake, he was even weirder by causing the room to tilt, invoke illusions like having paintings of the execs laughing at you, and having one of the men getting their face burned off to make a grotesque skull. To beat him and fix your controller issues because you will have them, you need to change your controller port just to be able to move and fight him. It's pretty messed up. While a lot of the bosses on this list were screwy in terms of mood, fourth wall breaking, or just making you think, what the fuck? Mantis is the only one that forces you to think outside the box, and even makes you physically alter your console settings to beat him. Luckily, when he comes back in Metal Gear Solid 4, the PS3 is just too much to handle. Still don't know why he can only read memory cards specifically, though. I'm the Fiery Joker, and, you know, I'm craving bosses with, you know, challenge, you know? Like, fair challenge, but, you know, special challenge, like, little oomph, like... Super challenge. Everyone, this is Josh. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Please check out my other social media like my Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr. Consider checking below the video and donating to my Patreon, Streamlabs for my merchandise, or becoming a YouTube member, and you'll get rewards like this. Our name shoutouts come from Brian Anderson, Sonic Cody, and Misty Phantom. Thanks for watching.